karma is what we're dealing with. Okay, the planets are the agents of karma, and karma is in the mind. So this is why what you're doing when you're reading the chart on any level, whether it's dashas, the natal chart, planets moving through the sky, is you're reading the karmas coming into the person's mind. Karma is literally on the level of the mind first. And it comes into the mind based on our past actions. So we've all heard that karma means action, and it does, but it's effective to realize how the process of karma works. Your past actions over lifetimes create the deep tendencies you have to see things a certain way. So stated more simply, it creates your mind. So your mind is a collection of time from this life and from past lives. So all of that is the karmic tendencies that you bring into life situations. And those tendencies shape your reality and create an identity, false identity, called an ego. So you think you are this person because of all of these actions you've taken through all these past lives, how that gives you a certain idea about what you think is happening now and how you're likely to react and to respond based on that. And that's what astrology is looking at. We're looking at a range of possibility. Because but based on your tendencies, which are shown in the chart. And those tendencies are based on your mind and your samskaras. So you want to understand something as well, that the natal chart shows a range of possibility that was established at birth. And, it's, and it, just level, it just penetrates to the level of the mind, not to the level of the actions you're going to take in this lifetime. The actions you take in this lifetime are going to be creating new cycles of karma, new some scars that you take into the future. So the natal chart shows those tendencies or what are called some scars that come from the planets and from the universal cosmic energy itself. So that's literally what astrology is first showing. It's showing your karmic tendencies based on all your past lives and the likely course of action that you might take now based on all of those astrological factors. So, but again, each moment, which is not a part of time on the soul level, you can introduce consciousness and presence into every situation, every karmic situation. So this is much deeper than your egoistic tendencies and your karmas. This is why spiritual practices focus on presence. Things like breath or silently repeating a mantra or self-remembrance. These practices take us out of our habitual, reactive, mental, karmic reality, which is shown by the chart and the triggering, or at least the lower qualities. So in that situation, when there's presence, the energy and karma from the planets will be influencing us still, but we will be coming from a much deeper level of consciousness and awareness. Thus, rather than being triggered on the surface, there will be a depth and consciousness on the soul level. So it's the same planetary energies Let's say it's still Mars, which might be frustrating you and making you feel irritated. But when you introduce presence and consciousness into that equation, now that energy of Mars, which when you were younger and dumber, would have gotten you into an argument and got you fighting with somebody. Now, because you've practiced yoga, you've become disciplined, that energy of Mars now becomes enormous focus and power and concentration and even compassion. Because now that energy, that same heat and energy of Mars that would have made you lash out through the ego to want to fight with somebody now becomes a great internal strength and in fact brings a lot of peace and stillness and allows you to have the courage to stay with the situation and not explode. It's still the same energy of Mars though, it's the same planet, same dasha, same transit, but you introduce consciousness and presence and that becomes a divine force not an egoistic one. Does that make sense? Perfect. You have comments on that? Because, you know, we're having a conversation. I'm not just a lecturer. <laughs> I like getting feedback on what I say. <laughs> yeah, so that's very interesting that you said, you know, that the free will component is always there. And many times people, they just feel that, you know, oh, what to do anyways, you know, my, <laughs> I have a screwed horoscope and, all my planets are either debilitated or, you know, they are conjunct malefics or they're aspected by malefics and, you know, my life is already ruined. So what to do anyways? And I have got into depression after learning astrology. So they need to hear this. <laughs> I, I actually saw you did a recent video that said, are you depressed after learning astrology? I, yeah. I say this, I've been saying this for a long time. Like, in fact, I used to call it, do you have a fear of astrology? Right? Because yeah. people get involved because of that. 
and it can magnify those fears. You know, people were afraid, and then they started studying astrology, and now they're terrified. <laughs> yeah, and I have seen this in India also. Like uh, some of my relatives are there. Not so oh, it's worse there. Some of, some of them know that I know astrology. So one of my relatives once told me <laughs> that I want to ask you a question, but I fear very much. I will ask you some later time. <laughs> yeah. And so in India, I think it's even a little worse because they're, they could be quite fatalistic about, about things. Yeah. And, um, but it yeah, so way this is just a failure. You can't do anything. Well, and also very much you have big things. You know, I thought I was, I thought life was dangerous. And then I found out about Sati Sati, ah, or Kala Sarpa Yoga, Rahu Transit, K2. I mean, it seems like, you know, once you understand what you're looking at, then you see that it's nothing but a kind of minefield of constant difficult. And but that's just life. It doesn't. It's not telling you anything new. It's just giving you a way to understand it, right? And yeah, there are many apps also which I have seen. I mean, which are very popular. I will not take name of those apps. So one of my I have installed one of my uh, one app of astrology. It's very popular. So in fact, yesterday morning I got a notification from that app. You know? Oh, is Saturn ruining your life? If yes, then please uh, do these remedies. So uh, somebody knows astrology, that's fine. But suppose somebody is a newcomer, beginner. He doesn't know anything about astrology. Well, that kind of language. Yeah, and then he sees that, you know, oh, there is a far off entity who is millions of miles away from me called Saturn, that dead planet, who, who, which, who, who I don't know. And I don't know why the hell in the universe is he taking... Uh, ruining my life you know? but when you know astrology you know he's just a part inside of you <laughs> which very is good yeah it's very important that you're saying those things Babajit yeah I again this is a, the way I explain it the way I've always explained it is that all of these planetary energies are all facets of the divine mother they're all different facets of the literally of the Divine Mother. You know, at the beginning of Brihat Parashahura Sastra, it says Lord Vishnu has taken form as the nine planets to bestow on the living beings the fruits of their karma, to destroy the demons, and to establish dharma. Now, again, Vishnu is that masculine form, which is the pure energy. But then the literal form is Lakshmi, his wife, which is there to maintain this universe. This whole universe that we see is... A, is a, is Mother Lakshmi to keep everything in balance. And there are many different ways to embody this energy. Also, you know, I happen to also um, worship uh, Lalita, you know, the playful goddess in that form, um, where all of this is just the playful nature of the goddess so that we can evolve and learn the true nature of who we are. And all of the planetary energies, the nakshatras, the good and the bad, and all that stuff that we want to put in those categories are all just different moods or facets of the Divine Mother. They're different leelas, the Divine leelas of Krishna, um, however you want to explain that. And this is the problem of people learning this without context, because nothing, it, nothing you know, everything in the Indian literature um, that explains the nature of the universe, like from the Puranas, for example, all of the stories of Krishna or, or from the Ramayana and, you know, the um, Mahabharata and all of that, they explain the nature of the world as the place where we come to work through our karma, to learn the true nature of who we are. We're placed on the wheel of time at a certain point in time and place. And then we come here with a physical body to take action based on what we think and who we think we are. And that's based on all of the stuff we've done before that we think is correct. So the world is a hard place because it gives us immediate feedback into what we think is truth so that we develop that toward a more divine truth. So there's a lot of painful realities in life. And when we don't understand the context of astrology or anything else, we can just feel victimized and scared. And it's never useful, whoever 
use that language in that app should really stop because again not to be foreboding but it's also not good karma to do that to put that kind of energy out we're all putting energy out and it comes yeah, back i don't want to that kind of energy out without context is not cool I, I I not only think that it is not good, but I think it's totally disgusting to do like that. And that's why, uh, you know, the, the, there's a lot of bad name which astrology gets, unfortunately. Right. Who, for whoever doesn't know, and nine, 80 to 90% of the world population, they don't know astrology. They've just heard this term and, and there's this fatalistic view, you know, that they are going to rip us apart once they see the horoscopes. <laughs> Well, this is why I said at the beginning what I said, that, that, the, that the reason people think astrology is what it is is because that's what they're taught, because they see that out there. That's why it's so important for people like us. Yes, we need to educate teach. them properly, you know, what, what yeah, actually it is. And, and at the very least, to teach this context, at the very least, always open people's context, open people's mind to what it really is, to what the universe really is. Rather than just focus on micro techniques, which are important, but first always start, you know, like this is a manual from one of my courses where I go very detailed about transits and whatnot, but I always start with these bigger frames, with this bigger framework, because first we need to understand what the universe is, what time is, and all of that context. Otherwise, we're just, again, learning how to, in fact, what, what really happens is it's our ego trying to manipulate the universe. Exactly. If you want to get really clear about what, how people focus on astrology, it's, it's even worse because the ego is scared and the ego is a bit of a monster that, is, that, we have to, that we have to grapple with. And the ego sees an advantage and the ego says, aha, here is something that I can use to get what I want, trick the universe somehow, somehow get around it all. Somehow now I got a tool that I'm smarter now. Than, and again, this is why the language in the Vedic astrology text as well is very clear. It says the Brahmin who doesn't have a knowledge of Jyotish or who misuses this science will go to the hell called Rao Rava and be reborn blind. So misusing it, not knowing it at all, again, these are different levels because if you don't know it, then you're just going to be blind and you're going to have a corrupted worldview, like I said earlier. But it, let's say that you learn it and then you coerce and mislead or manipulate, then obviously that would be an even worse sort of punishment, so to speak. And again, they use these terms loosely. I don't like to use words punishment, but those texts give an indication of how we're supposed to perceive things. Yeah, and to be very honest, I have seen people, uh, people who are actually very lazy. They are completely headless. They don't know what to do in life. So then what they do is, uh, rather than, you know, doing meditation and understanding things in the right context, as you said, rather than doing that, then I've seen that, you know, they will go to 10 different astrologers. And I have said this again and again and again, if you do not know what you want to do in life, no astrologer can tell you. Because the same planet placed in a house for you will give you a different profession. And for somebody else, it will give you a different profession. So you have to tell to the astrologer that I want to do these two, two or three or four plans you know, as my career. Then the astrologer can suggest you that, okay, maybe among these three or four, this can be good. But if you go to an astrologer blankly and you say, sir, can you please tell me what should I do in life? I mean, I don't think anybody can say that to you. That is for you to decide what you have to do. We can just tell you to what extent that could be in line with your karmas. So that's very important you know, to understand things in the right context. Yeah. And, and, you know, like it says here, you know, this first part, just talking about what karma is, we have these tendencies and, but it says here, who's playing who. So from that deepened state of consciousness, as we interact with life and the samskaras and the karma in the mind, from a deepened state of consciousness, mind, body, and soul becomes a great instrument. This is what yoga is when we're, conscious and a deeper state of awareness so we hear this all the time in yoga to be an instrument of the divine yes that's what happens but what are the actual instruments that are being played what are the powers that we have once we become clear and the answer of course is the planets but rather than having them play us then we play them and not because we want to manipulate or coerce but because we want to know the self 
hopefully. So when we're unaware and ignorant, we get played by their energies and pulled back and forth. The good ones play us as a sort of attachment to a wispy promise of eternal happiness. This is how the good planets can play us. Oh, Venus, love, Mercury, fun, Jupiter, I'm so excited, I'm so elated, right? We, we get played on that level by the good ones, and then the bad ones, Saturn, I'm going to die, Mars, I hate you, <laughs> Rahu and K2, right? So we're either getting played or we're playing them, right? Yeah, as it says, the bad ones play us as an attachment to survival and self-defense. So again, once we introduce consciousness, those things we want so much, those desires for happiness become shared with others rather than gobbled up and consumed by us. This is what winds up happening, especially with those gentle benefic planets. So we want all the Venus for ourselves. We want all the Mercury for ourselves. No, once we get more consciousness, we want to share. And if my Venus comes at your expense, then I'm not happy either. That's a more enlightened choice. If I'm the only one talking, then I'm not happy either. That's the higher quality Mercury. Exactly. Where I get just as much enjoyment listening to you and reflecting back and coming together than just saying what I have to say. Yeah, and many times I've also seen that you know people will ask you queries or you, are, you will see these articles about, you know, like, good married life or you know a great career where you're earning million dollars but many times i have seen that people like the idea of such certain things but when they get it they are not ready to pay the price and work for it for example uh they say you know happy married life you know, but <laughs> it's a lot of effort to you know maintain the marriage or if you want a million dollar job then suppose tomorrow God comes and gives you that job or any, you know, Bill Gates calls you and says that, hey, I'm going to hire you in Microsoft and I'll pay you a million dollars. But that's going to come with a price. So a price. if you do not have that necessary discipline in your life, if you are not having Sattva Guna in your life, if you're not structured, if you're not clear, even if you get that thing, you will lose it or you cannot maintain it. And that will cause you a lot of trouble later on. That's what and happens. This is what happens with, again, in, in a astrological evaluation, you wind up looking and seeing how much, for instance, with the job, how much it's connected to our svadharma, to our purpose. There are people who that's their purpose, is to take on that kind of responsibility and pressure. But if it's not, eventually the pressure will break you. And we look at the astrological transits and timing cycles to see when that happens. It's going to break you when you get some pressure going to that 10th house over the 10th Lord, aspect, Saturn, Dasha, something where you'll see that issue of duty, responsibility, pressure, career, and that kind of equation in your life will come and will pop out. And then your whole issue around power and money and value and all that stuff will then ripen. That's when that karma ripens. But the thing to understand though, or that I'm making here is that the whole sort of um you know the range of possibility which is so often overlooked it's often seen as a weakness and this is one of the things to also observe is that people who want to try to evaluate astrology or find the value in it often and again these are people that don't really do it like professionally or see it all the time or whatever want to make it seem like, well, and, you know, if you get the prediction right, then that's the only thing that matters. Like, did you predict that they would do it or not do it? Do it or not do it? Like, and that's the only metric through which it has any value. And again, as someone, I started doing readings professionally 2004, and especially since 2006, I've done more than 200 paid readings a year for God knows how long. And I will tell you the least important part of any reading is whether you get the prediction right or not. Now that doesn't mean people don't think that, but again, predicting something, it goes back to what I said before. You're predict they're asking you for a prediction because they believe that they want a prediction that's going to tell them how their life is going to go. And they're going to get some kind of comfort on that. The truth of the matter is they actually don't. They want you to tell them what they want to hear. And if you don't, then you're going to argue with them for the rest of the reading about that. <laughs> and yeah, but actually what they really want 
is to be empowered. They want to understand what's happening in their life. They want to understand why they're feeling all of this stuff that I'm talking about here. They want to have greater understanding of the, that's what the karma is. The karma is their mind based on their past actions. And they're grappling with trying to understand who they are, why they're here, and why they're dealing with this thing right now. That's what they want. And I know this now because I've done it <laughs> enough times that this is what they really want. And when you give them freedom and you explain that, then you open up the possibility so that they know why they're stuck where they are. They know what the enlightened choice is. And they're looking at themselves saying, I know what I need to do. Do I have the power and strength and spiritual growth to actually do it? And now you're, in, now you're bringing them into that moment where there's creative choice. And, you know, part of free will is also consciousness. And, and the free will to decide to be present is also part of free will. So I saw you were about to say something. What did you want to say to that? No, uh, what I wanted to say was, like you said, uh, sometimes if people don't understand that, you know, then they can also argue with you. So, for example, uh, many times people have... Uh, apparently contradictory placements for example i've seen sometimes that you have venus which is uh, afflicted so called by saturn <laughs> by aspect and then it's uh, uh, aspected by jupiter also so then people have this ideology you know okay saturn is bad jupiter is good so plus and minus they will cancel each other so saturn's aspect uh, on my Venus, that dreaded aspect is cancelled by the that divine optimistic aspect of Jupiter. Well, that's not the case. You know, they will have their individual areas. Saturn's aspect on Venus will have an effect irrespective of Jupiter aspects it or not. And Jupiter's aspect on Venus will also have an effect irrespective of Saturn's aspect uh, is playing out there and then there are so many things it will depend on degrees which one is a closer aspect and what actually Venus is doing in the chart so that's what I was about to say that you know we should holistically read the chart in a way that we can help somebody rather than not just you know individually delving into things like oh Saturn is bad Jupiter is good so well that's the problem and especially you know this is the Again, and now it's good that people understand astrology a little bit more. And when they come to you now, they, they know their chart, quote, know it, quote. They know where things are. And they've been, frankly, corrupted enough to think they actually know what they're looking at. That's, it's actually a big thing these days that half of the reading, I, I'm unlearning them sometimes um, to stop misinterpreting their chart and actually showing them. Because, again, in many ways... Saturn's influence, uh, this, you, you gave a good example because it's actually completely upside down in this sense that Jupiter's influence on Venus is going to be more disruptive than Saturn's, absolutely almost all the time. Um, now, it, you know, because Jupiter and, and Venus are naturally inimical because Venus teaches us how to compromise and get along on Earth, and Jupiter teaches us how to leave it based on gurus and teachings. And usually the influence of Jupiter onto Venus makes unrealistic fantasies about relationships and soulmate fantasies that lead to disappointments. <laughs> it's often much, and Saturn's influence on Venus is usually that we're realistic and practical and appreciate our partners and work hard to make the relationship work, like you said. So again, it's completely based, of course, I haven't even mentioned what the planets rule, which is the most important in any exactly. chart, functional exactly. nature exactly. of the planet because again you can have this idea where maybe saturn is aspecting venus and and so is jupiter so saturn's influence on venus is actually more beneficial to what venus wants to do which is keep a partnership together but let's say that jupiter is a functional benefic for the person let's say it's an aries ascendant or leo ascendant where both saturn and venus are functional malefics so that nature of jupiter to come in and disrupt the relationship feels better to the person because Jupiter is a Dharma planet. So they actually enjoy disrupting the relationship and having their partners not live up to the soulmate fantasy they have, but it winds up under my, so again, it's all kinds of complexity. So again, and all of, like you correctly said, all of it needs to be explained. This is what I, 
ram into my students' heads all the time. It's like, stop looking for the one sentence that you're going to say that's going to encapsulate this whole thing. This one sentence that's going to say, okay, well, it's this and it's that, so does this trump that? So what is the word I say? Well, what you do is you explain all of this to the person. Because guess what? Life is complicated. Everything, everyone's relationships are complicated. So you need to know how to unravel that in a chart. Yeah, and many and explain, times. And explain that to the person. That's, that's what a good astrologer does, is he actually explains the things to the person in quite a neutral way without judging it or making it wrong. You explain it, and then the person understands it. Again, they came to you because they want you to make a prediction about whether or not they should leave their partner. And instead of going down that rabbit hole, you're saying, so here's what's happening in your relationships. And you're explaining them and their tendency to see it that way. And that does nothing but liberate them because they don't want to leave their partner. They don't want to have horrible relationships. And they're likely just in a pattern because they're having this relationship with this person, but they had the same one in a different version with the last one. So they want to understand their tendencies. There's some scars. They think they want you to tell them whether or not they should leave the partner. <laughs> I'm sorry, you were about to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, that's what uh, I was wanting to add into us that many times people say, you know, that what is my destiny? Why I'm born, for example. So people think that, you know, there's like one sentence, as you said. Yeah. Okay, you are destined. What's my purpose? I want to know my purpose. 